Jerry Lawson is a proud member of the Heilsick First Nation. He currently manages the Oral History and Language Lab at the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology. With over 15 years in the field of information management and digitization, he works to develop practical, scalable resources for indigenous cultural heritage preservation and to decolonize information practices. Jerry sits on the board of directors for the First Peoples Cultural Council, acts as the technology lead for the UBC, um, for the innovative UBC indigitization program, and works with several other groups to advocate for both indigenous language revival and digital heritage preservation. My uh, co-organizers and I approached Jerry to speak about his work with the Language Lab and with the UBC Indigitization Program, as we believe that these conversations around decolonizing practices of heritage preservation directly overlap with the methodological and ethical questions related to performances preservation. And so I'm now going to turn it over to Jerry, and please um, join me in welcoming him um, and thanking him for his contributions. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, thank you for coming out uh, this early in the morning, uh, early for me. Uh, this is a really, really interesting gathering to me. I do a lot of work with um, arts and time-based media art and have conversations around what is the essence of something and how do you preserve it. And I'm really looking forward to um, some of the upcoming panels and to hearing from some of the other people about their practices. Um, in looking at the um, focus of this gathering, I had to look at what is my practice and how does it tie into performance and um, preserving performance, and it's not actually that difficult. Um, our cultures in the Pacific Northwest, I'm Helchik, which is uh, centered in Bella Bella. I think that's about um, 400 kilometers north of here or so. Um, our ceremonies are drumming and dancing. Um, our governance is oration, and um, our histories and truths are communicated through story and song. Um, performance is how we interact with the world, how we govern ourselves. It is almost everything to indigenous communities in terms of um, history and how we, um, how we convey anything. Um, for a little bit of context, we have about half of the indigenous languages in Canada in the province of British Columbia, most of them uniquely in British Columbia. Um, there are 203 First Nations communities here. The diversity um, in terms of global comparative is tremendous. Um, this man is the reason that I do a lot of what I do. This is my father, Chester Lawson. Um, he carries the name Komagoya, which is one of the hereditary chief's names from my area. Um, and Dad was, uh, has always impressed on myself and my family uh, the importance of culture and language revitalization. Um, before that was really a term, before that was something that we talked about openly around um, as a theme. The idea of pr preserving who we are is uh, something that has always been important to my family. Um, and you'll find that our best and brightest in our communities um, could succeed in finance or other areas, and they are starting to, but most of the people of my dad's generation who managed to uh, go to university became teachers, which is what my dad did. Teachers or nurses or doctors or lawyers to fight for indigenous rights, in which uh, we weren't allowed to hire a lawyer until 1953. This is the, uh, um, this is the site of the residential school that my father went to. He went to Port Alberni. This school burned down and they built something else in this place, but I don't have a picture of that. Um, so uh, I think everybody probably has a little bit of a background in residential schools and what that system has done to, um, to our communities. Um, but residential schools didn't operate in a vacuum. Um, residential schools are probably the single biggest system of stealing language and culture from our generations. but. Um, there are systems that uh, where policy and assimilative and erasive um, agendas manifest. And um, a lot of that happens through the people who get to become experts about us. And for our earliest indigenous collections, 
Um, again, a lot of those are taken by missionaries who first came and the first people to enter our, uh, our villages and our communities. Um, the earliest anthropologists, um, you could read linguists, ethnomusicologists, government agents, all the people that came in to study us. Um, I've heard from many different community organizations I work with. Um, there's a point probably in the 90s where our community started to develop research protocols that nobody could do work with our communities without signing on to the research protocols of our communities. And this is in response to people coming into our communities for three months and then leaving as experts in our civilization. Right. People who develop policy, people who impact what happens to us on a daily basis and, a, and on a lifetime. Um, so museum collections, um, masks, regalia, whistles, all um, things that we use in um, our performative cultures, things that are integral to who we are, extracted from our communities, um, and contextualized through a Western lens. Um, and so you know, there are people who can speak about this much better than I can, and I mean people in the room, Luann is in the back there. Um, this is not the core of what I do, older collections and our communities, but it impacts me on a daily basis in terms of what I know about my own culture, what has been passed to me, um, that uh, there are things that, um, that my father wouldn't talk to me about, um, that uh, I didn't find out he went to residential school till I was 16. He was a teacher at my school. I found out from a friend of mine. <laughs> One of my best friends learned about it in his uh, social studies class. <laughs> and that's how I found out my father went to residential school. So when you think about the TRC and you think about the impacts of understand, coming to an understanding of what Canada has done to its indigenous peoples, think about the fact that our own communities haven't had that conversation for very long either. That the people who went to residential school um, would think of it as something that they didn't want to pass on to the next generation. We all knew about it. It was the elephant in the room, we all knew that horrible things happened, but nobody talked about it. Um, so I'm gonna quote uh, Lorna Williams, um, who's an educator in a language, um, Dr. Lorna Williams, uh, who did a keynote at the Hellasep Conference, which was put on by the First Peoples Cultural Council um, less than a year ago and a couple of blocks away. Um, and she quoted Ang Angelique Stump, uh, we're trying to put together a mirror shattered in a million pieces. Not just languages, but the very fabric of our lives, knowledge systems, cultural practice, traditions, languages. Um, I reached out to Lorna and asked her for permission to talk about, to, to use these words because they were so powerful. And these are, um, this is in a video online, go to the First People's website. I would recommend everybody go and listen to Lorna's speech because it is absolutely brilliant and moving. Um, but this is a really good analogy of what we're doing, that we've had cultures that um, through residential school, through other positions, through the potlatch ban, we haven't been allowed to practice. Um, it's been illegal, people could be jailed. Pe um, indigenous people in regalia, not more than three, couldn't assemble in public during the potlatch ban that only ended in 1953. Um, so our own knowledge of ourselves has been fractured and taken away and held in archives and um, in faraway places and used by people external to ourselves to um, contextualize us and develop policy. Um, Things are getting better through things like the um, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and uh, the uh, Task Force on Museums and something, uh, Task Force on Museums and First Peoples, uh, both in the 90s, 1992 for the Task Force, 96 for RCAP. Um, there were a number of recommendations um, for museums around uh, making collections accessible and around the relationship with Indigenous peoples and around representation of Indigenous people in museums. Um, some of that has gotten a lot of traction, and not right away for sure. It takes a long time to change practices. It takes a long time to change hearts and minds, to change the way that people are taught as they enter discipline and the way that people act within the discipline. So I would like to say that um, 
at the Royal BC Museum, at MOA, at most of the um, museums that have ongoing relationships with Indigenous people, the Burke Museum. Um, there are really, really good practices and people put resources in to allow Indigenous communities to come and, um, and at least don't put up barriers to people having access to the things that they actually have the privilege of getting access to. In some cases, there is co-government over uh, Indigenous collections, where at MOA we have things that are um, sacred or secret that uh, people have to contact a representative from the community who's been designated by a community as the person who can say yes or no, you can visit with that belonging. Um, so things are moving along in, in a better way. Um, things are moving along but lagging behind in archives. Um, archives has its own documents. There's uh, uh, protocols on Native American um, archival collections that I was speaking with somebody about yesterday uh, that my sister was one of the people who was at the initial meeting in 2006. Um, I'm actually on a, uh, a committee that's the task force for the um, Canadian Archives response to the Truth and Reconciliation calls to action um, that is ongoing and chaired by Erica Hernandez-Reed and um, Donald Johnson. Um, and Erica is one of the partners in my own program. She's the archivist at the University of Northern BC. Um, and it's hard work to put these documents together. And I won't claim to be a primary author. I'm someone who sort of responds and pokes holes at things. But uh, group authoring around these sort of topics is difficult. And I would say that the archival profession is one that has a very strong collective culture um, that is hard fought for ethics that they believe in, but that those don't always meet the needs of Indigenous peoples. Um, so activating archives, uh, I was gonna put a slide there, I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I did speak a little bit about um, Again, archives is lagging behind, but very similar um, notions that you see in museum collections, you're starting to see in archives, where things like um, collections that have um, cultural sensitivities might be co-governed by an indigenous community where that relationship exists. Um, for instance, our own archives of MOA, we have a 33,000 image collection from Vicki Jensen, who's a photographer who worked in, worked in many indigenous communities in BC. And um, we had, I think, about 700 and something images from uh, the Musqueam community. Um, and we started to do the work of figuring out what can we make accessible and what can't we. And through the very initial parts of that conversation, we just realized, well, the Musqueam archives can manage these. So we just wholesale transferred. Um, we still have a copy of them. We ask Musqueam when we want to use something, um, uh, depending upon if uh, if we already have prearranged um, ability, uh, authority to use uh, a photograph, if we don't, then we'll contact the Musqueam Archive and they'll contact the right person. But you can just transfer that authority to Indigenous communities or co-governing is something that can happen in archives as well and is starting to. Um, I spoke to Erica, who's the archivist at the University of Northern BC in Prince George, and um, that archive has had long-standing storage agreements with many of the communities in the North where um, I've worked in partnership with Erica for I think over four years and she's never a single time talked to me about who they hold these storage agreements with. They're held sacred and they do a really good job of maintaining those relationships. Even though I work on a daily basis with some of the communities that they tell me have stores, items stored at the UNBC, it's a, it's a firewall that's never broken. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge some of the good work that's going on. Um, the uh, Sorry, the BC Archives hired Genevieve Weber, who's uh, also on the TRC task force, uh, and her entire job is uh, working with Indigenous communities to activate uh, the provincial archive. Um, the American Philosophical Society, Brian Carpenter, has been doing tremendous work of activating, activating their archive. At the same time, the breadth and the poor description historically is a massive barrier to these early um, collections being associated, like being reconnected to community. Um, and I didn't talk about this slide, so. Uh, this is the Helton Cultural Education Center, at least the outside of it. Um, and some 30 years ago, um, this is a small resource center in Bella Bella, in my own community, that has the mandate of um, storing, preserving, and, um, and encouraging um, health check culture revitalization and the preservation of, um, of our history. Uh, and I was lucky enough um, 
to get a tour of what they called the vault. And the vault is a really good term. Uh, it basically, it was hundreds of open reel recordings, um, open reel video, um, VHS data, um, probably about seven or eight different formats, um, thousands of media objects, many of them that weren't playable already at that time. And um, I've already sort of passed across the notion that our cultures tend to be performative. I am not. I have no rhythm. <laughs> this is not a lie. I, um, I'm useless for singing, dancing, drumming. Um, I embarrass easily, which I'm not sure why I'm in front of you. <laughs> but in seeing these things, I am fairly technical. I solve things fairly quickly. I can. I thought I can do this. This is something I can do. I can help to migrate these this media to another format. Um, and then I forgot about it for a while. Um, and um, this is actually, many of these are from the um, Health and Culture Education Center. This is actually my grandfather that I carry his name, Malibus. Um And he passed away in the, the early 90s. Um, this is half inch open reel um, video, which is a super problematic format that I never thought I'd see after uh, um, I left working with, um, onto the next slide, the, well, two slides later. Um, so this is a typical community collection. So the collections I tend to work with are the collections that communities have hard repatriated from those other collections or created themselves. There are hundreds and hundreds of tapes in every community that are oral histories, traditional use studies, language recordings, uh, community-directed recordings that support language, culture revitalization, community history, um, and land and title cases. Um, and if you remember that map of the diversity in BC, there are 203 communities in BC, and every one of these has these collections. There are tens of thousands of media objects in our communities. Um, and again, sort of fast forward from when I was, um, took a tour of my own resource center in my own community. Um, and my sister Kim it was the head of the UBCIC resource center, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. And that's the most active legal research center for indigenous rights in Canada. Um, and they have a wide and varied media collection. Um, and I was sort of in between things. I just sold a business and they needed low cost, marginal technical support, and I could do that. Um, and we started to run digitization projects. And um, Kim um, has her master's of archival science. Uh, we could read best practices. We could go and find the documents. We had wide networks of people who uh, should have been able to support us, but the advice that you would get is go read best practices, follow that. Well, best practices would never actually be implementable as a practice. There were, um, there were specifications for equipment that were never released by manufacturers, that you had no way to measure. You had no way to know if you were meeting best practices in certain cases. In other cases, there was no new equipment available that met the best practices you were supposed to be meeting. Um, archival jargon is um, confusing and impenetrable, and audio engineering jargon is even worse, and video broadcast engineering. So, um, so it's not that the best practices were wrong. I wanna say that. There are very, very smart people who are assembling the technical specifications that they thought were correct for how you should preserve things. It's the way they were articulated by people who didn't understand them themselves, as if they did. That people would come out of library school and they would just, they were told to use best practices. They would tell everybody else to use best practices. Nobody actually met best practices, is what I found. Library of Congress has workarounds. You always have technicians in the background just making something happen magically. And we all get to say, yes, we meet best practices, but none of us do. <laughs> so, um, in doing that work for a little while with um, indigenous nonprofits, um, my sister took a job at UBC at the Waywa, um, at the only indigenous academic library in Canada. Um, I followed soon after. Um, getting the job as the Oral History and Language Lab Manager at MOA after a $55 million um, renewal project at the, uh, at the museum. Uh, they built a, 
an oral history mining lab. Um, but to be frank, they didn't really know what they were going to do with it. Um, it was something that was really great to put into grant. And it was, you know, one of those components that gets you $55 million of money to stop it leaking on your collections and increase your footprint by 40%. But we don't really have a legacy of doing language work at the museum. We work with the community to get some language around an exhibit. We have some alternate terms they're called in our database around what you would call a drama. But you don't really do language work at a museum. Um, you can, but it wasn't a certain legacy. We had one researcher, Dr. Patricia Shaw, was our name researcher that was attached to, and if you look on the right side, we've got a microphone there. The, um, it was all designed around a sound booth for high quality audio recording. But in the 10 years between writing a grant and actually building a building, um, high quality portable audio recorders were developed. <laughs> and now you can go into a community and sit in somebody's living room. And the museum itself developed something called the Reciprocal Research Network, which puts all of our collections, but also 26 other collections um, of indigenous materials into a single searchable um, research network. So now you can sit with a laptop in an elder's um, living room and look at belongings. And there's no replacement for somebody being able to hold something, being with it. It does prompt memories that aren't um, evoked other ways. But, uh, um, but it is expensive to bring people to Vancouver. And UBC is not on the way to or from anywhere. It's <laughs> at the end of the thing. So you have to be going there to get them. So nobody just happens to be at UBC. So, um, so basically, the whole notion that we would have a lab that would do nothing but recording all day was flawed to start with. So my background in digitization, I went out and bought an open reel recorder, cassette player, all the video machines you see on the left, and took on digitization as a secondary core function. And now it's really what we're best known for. Um, being as I'm the only person in the lab, what I'm best known for um, <laughs> in, um, in terms of the Oral Stream Language Lab. We, um, Started out, uh, it, early on, my boss was Ann Stevenson, our information manager, and a lot of the things that I'm able to do, I owe to her and her ability to navigate UBC, her ethics. Um, and she is the one who uh, um, agreed that I can sit there digitizing things all day for the rest of my career and barely make a dent in British Columbia. Um, so helping communities to do this work themselves. Um, is one of the things that uh, was an absolute ethic from the beginning, um, before any partnerships were made. Um, how do you take what is actually a really expensive investment at a university museum and make it effective for indigenous community language and culture revitalization? Uh, that's a big question. Um, and every project I got into, we did sort of advance and move forward um, a bit, but the um, advancing the services that the lab would um, provide, but also advancing the networks and relationships that uh, um, that I had with me when I came, but uh, but gaining more of them. Um, and I was lucky enough that somebody else that I worked with, the UBC New Chiefs, also took a job at UBC. And that seems to be what UBC does. It just hires <coughs> people from the union, one after the other, because we actually hired my the Alyssa Cherry, who replaced my sister as the head of the resource center, now works with me at MoMA. So it's what we do. Um, and Mimi found herself managing sort of a crazy pilot project called Indigitization. And it, the whole purpose of it was to address some of, those, some of the issues around um, the technical barriers for digitizing your cultural heritage. And it was really around creating a manual, a set of paper resources to help uh, communities to digitize their own cultural heritage. And Mimi gave me a call one day and asked me, can you recommend some equipment that we can lend to community for preservation digitization? And, and the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is if you just get a set of boxes of equipment and send it to somebody's desk, they will not know how to put it together. They won't feel confident they've done, put it together right. They won't know what software to use, what file formats to go to, how to deal with the files. Um, so, um, so I told her, well, Okay, you, you can't do that. You have to at least give people instructions. You have to buy it, test it, make sure it works together. Manufacturers can't be trusted that mm -hmm. this is going to work with all operating systems, um, et cetera. So um, 
And then my boss, Ann, said, well, you can't do that either. You have to give managers planning advice or else you end up with something that's more ephemeral and more risky than just having the physical container. Um, so basically off the side of our desks, we uh, wrote a 90 page manual on how to digitize the easiest format there is to digitize and put together a, um, a portable digitization kit that uh, is all connected um, semi-permanently within a case and then you just unravel six wires, they're all labeled, you plug them in and you're ready to digitize. And over the years we've had dozens of people put it together and nobody's ever felt like they've done it wrong. So that in and of itself is a massive <laughs> move forward. Um, and luckily enough, a part of that pilot project was the Health Culture Education Center. So the first kit ever was tested. This is Jennifer Carpenter, who's been the director since the center's inception, and Rory Hosty, who was the technician at the time and now has gone on to be a language teacher at the college and the community. Um, and we knew we were onto something when uh, they didn't send the kit back. They <laughs> said, just send us a bill. So this is the first kit and it's still in um, Bella Bella. And we've replaced the audio interface that does the digitizing and we're just replacing the cassette deck now and it's digitized hundreds of cassettes and, um, and it's still going. As in you just replace the components when they wear out but, uh, um, but it's something that's been um, active in the community for the last probably uh, six or seven years. Um, so what happens at the end of a pilot project? <laughs> well, hopefully, all of your work doesn't go it's in the basement at university somewhere. So um, we went and um, went to the original funders, the Irwin K. Barber Center, part of the UBC library system, with a modest ask, hoping to maybe lend it to a community, bring it back in, reformat the computer, send it out again and maybe abandon it somewhere and let it do good work. And um, they had a bit of money that was earmarked for community development and saw value in this and invested $100,000 a year to turn it into a grant program, similar to the BC History Digitization Program that uh, Ibram K. Barber funds. Um, and so now we have uh, been running for, for a few years, I think since 2013 was our first intake. Um, we give people planning advice. Uh, we have six lending kits, um, in-person training. Um, it's a matching grant. Uh, we do require that communities put up 50% in cash or in kind. Um, we've done some massaging around things like uh, digitization grant budgets have never ever made sense. So we've tried to make ours make sense. Um, we've changed it so that a permanent employee can be a cash match so that the uh, Usually in a digitization grant, the only thing that you can really spend is on a digitization technician. You hire somebody to do all the work, but then that means that all of your experience walks out the door on the last day of your project. So um, we've tried to change our grant, and we, we're, we're looking at, um, at the grant in terms of whether we require a match anymore, whether it just becomes um, a grant for a grant's sake. Um, and so this, I, like, I used to call indigenization a um, protest project against best practices <laughs> because they were so hard to meet and so hard to de decipher and there was such a barrier to us that we basically just put together practices that worked whether they met or not we did practices that were practical and good enough um, and figured that I could be a lightning rod for anyone who any preservation specialist who wanted to um, to attack them and, and it's never happened the fact is people don't really read practices and compare them. Um, but we also encoded everything that we know in, on our own ethics. So we um, host in-person training, um, and that's so that people can train together, so that cohorts can become their own support network. They're going to run into problems in community that we don't run into at a university. Um, and we found that this is bearing out, that people are starting to have those discussions more broadly. Um, and what we're trying to do is make ourselves less important as time goes on. We don't want UBC to be, be the hub of this forever. We want communities to be, um, a, to basically be a community of practice. Um, so we teach um, file organization and project um, management, um, cassette repair, sort of common problems that you'll run into, the practical hands-on of it. Um, we also, bring people to, in, introduce them to everybody that we work with at UBC that does good, engaging work with community. Um, and 
Down on our right, we have a um, basically a protocol lunch where we invite directors and heads and people who actually hold money and positions of authority at UBC, and we introduce them to the people who are actually working on the projects so that we can actually have some level of visibility on campus that people can understand why this costs money, why we should be doing it, what this brings back. Um, and if, if this remains invisible to the people who give you money, um, then you basically it's easy to cut your program. Um, and in the upper left, that's WAWA, that's the um, Library at the First Nations House of Learning, and that's um, EOSD. Judy Thompson is a Taltan, the head of the Taltan Language Program and a professor at UVic. Um, and she actually just announced she won a major award yesterday, the um, 2020 3M National Teaching Fellowship Award. Um, and this is her finding a Taltan language report that had been lost to the community for years. Even the author didn't have a copy of that. And so we told Weiwa who we were funding, who the recipients were, and they brought out everything they thought people would be interested in. And we've never had one of these engagements where you haven't had additional benefit come out of those meetings. Um, and I think as Lake Babine was trying to set up a uh, library for their community and Weiwa was, and both Moa and Weiwa had um, books that they were um, removing from their collection that they sent back with them to uh, help seed the library. Um, the impact so far, this is a little bit dated, but um, over 40 projects, over 11,000 cassettes, digitized in the province. And again, when I started this, a digitization project where 30 cassettes were digitized was a massive success. That um, this just wasn't happening at all. And people would go and start to research how to digitize and just run into nothing but barriers. And everybody in community is really good at a lot of things, a lot of things. So when you run into this many problems trying to do something that should be simple, you basically go back to all those things that are piling up in your desk. So um, if nothing else, we're really proud of just being able to get some stuff out of the way of already motivated people. Um, so what happened last year? We had the lowest number of applicants we've ever had in our grant. And that happened to coincide with the First Peoples Cultural Council, the provincial government investing $50 million into language in the province of BC. And basically, for the first time ever, everybody who wanted to work with language in their communities could actually work teaching language or developing language pedagogy. And they didn't have to have soft money. Um, there are all these things they need. They need these digitized um, collections to help develop um, language teaching and to use as language resources. But it's not the core of actually being in a classroom with people and communicating language. So we lost half of our recipient, the people who would normally be applying for our grant because they were busy doing the actual work that they should be doing. Um, so what we did was we tried to figure out, okay, do we fold our tent or do we try to figure out how to be effective through this period? Um, so what we did was we invited uh, the First Peoples Cultural Council to uh, come to our training session. Library and Archives Canada has regional archivists. We invited them. Uh, and we created a bursary for communities who didn't have a project actively but wanted to learn about digitization and what the sort of scope of effort was. So we probably have I think four funded projects in here, and then everybody else is from other organizations um, where it's either bursaries or other um, organizations that do compatible things to our program. Um, and what's happened uh, over the years, Library and Archives Canada has um, reached out to us about our grant and announced uh, their Listen Hear Our Voices Fund um, for digitization in community. Um, and they are going to be, I think, rolling out their second call soon. Uh, their first call was last year that uh, closed in July. Uh, that was, I think, a month and a half after our digitization training session. Um, and then um, First Peoples Cultural Council, again, um, I'm on the board of directors. They're centered here. They did our Crown Corporation that distributes all the language funding in British Columbia, or the vast majority of it. And they announced their uh, Digi grant, um, also based off of our grant. And um, these grants dwarf ours. They are of much greater magnitude than, um, than our grant ever was. And um, the, uh, the Digi grant, for example, is funding the same amount um, of money and the same, um, uh, actually, in one round, they're giving out more money than we've given out in the last seven years. And in one round, they're funding almost the same number of communities that we've worked with. 
um, over time. Uh, so what we were doing is setting aside our grant for this year in order to support communities in accessing these much larger pools of money. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to say that this, is, this happened two weeks ago at the Musqueam uh, Cultural Center. That's Elizabeth McManus, who was, um, uh, I think, in maybe the second or third round of the indigenization um, training that Musqueam Archives has had a couple of grants through indigenization. Um, and Elizabeth is delivering training for the First Peoples grants and is the first time that I get to sit in supporting role and have somebody else as the primary person delivering, uh, um, delivering training. And their training, I believe, was 13 different community organizations. So this is a massive step forward for the province. And it's something that I had identified as my primary goal for this year is to get the hell out of the way as the only person delivering this. And then immediately Elizabeth stepped up. Um, and, and they ran their second round um, over the last two days. So I've been in Victoria. They're doing this round without me entirely. Um, so, and what happens with our project over this year? Um, we'll, we will be supporting the First Peoples um, grant training programs, but we also um, have negotiated a National Research Council Indigenous Language Technologies project. Um, and we applied for this last April, and it was actually signed in mid-January. <laughs> and it has to be finished by the fiscal year end, which is March 31st. Uh, so uh, the methodology has changed slightly, but um, right now we have um, resources for communities to digitize cassette tapes, and because that's a really standard, easy format to digitize, and every other format has complexities that we don't really know how to help people through, but we can't let that stop us anymore. The fact that we don't know how to do it can't let us stop from giving people advice. Um, so we'll be rolling out open real uh, buying guides for all of these formats for open real VHS beta camcorder formats outsourcing guides um, guerrilla video tutorials so that people across Canada will be able to self-serve or internationally but within Canada we have another year where people will be able to access funding and then it's not guaranteed after that so it, there is a real race to get these things out there to help people to if people can't plan their projects, if they can't build rational budgets and projects, they won't get funding. And if they don't get funding and those funds lapse, um, it's easy to say if people, not enough people applied or if the quality of project wasn't big enough, then it's not worth funding. So, um, so uh, associated with this, we'll be running um, three regional workshops around these new formats in BC um, by the first week of April. So. Um, so again, I didn't have um, permission or uh, time to reach out to everybody, but I did want to talk a little bit about some of the things that have come by me and just in my little sphere of um, network that uh, um, see Katie. Um, so there are some really, really important ways that um, the older connect collections are being reconnected to community. Um, the Museum of Anthropology has just started an Indigenous internship program um, that literally brought in our first cohort two weeks ago. And one of those people is Trevor Isaac, who is working with uh, Katie Bun Marcuse in the audience here, who will be speaking on the next panel. And um, Katie came to me, where we sat on a committee together, I think it was a couple years ago, um, talked about a really interesting project she was working on that she found, it was Franz Boas recordings that wax cylinders um, and film that weren't known to be associated were actually recorded at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they were able to find out that, um, that a song that wasn't associated with a dance anymore, that those things were associated. Um, and I'm sure, hopefully we'll be talking about that next round. But we're able to connect that to the families that hold those responsibilities today. And those and one of those people is working with Katie, so that this is a community-connected project that is bringing knowledge back to the community. Um, I don't know if you know who Gujao is. He's a Haida chief who is um, one of the most active um, figures in indigenous rights and uh, title movement and um, in uh, through the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s till today. Um, Gujao was walking by my office one day and he said, oh, I, 
I learned a Helchik song that was in the Haida collection. It was something that had come to Haida Gwaii through marriage. Um, and I can't remember what collection this was a part of. Um, I've got a recording of it, which would tell me, but, uh, um, <coughs> but he said, like, I, I want to sing it for you. So I grabbed a recorder from my office. We walked into the room next door, and I recorded this song that was gifted <coughs> to my father and to um, the Helchik Culture Education Center for, for use. But uh, it was a, a Helchik song that was um, brought to Haida through marriage and had, was lost to our community, and then was gifted back at a, um, the reaffirmation of a 120-year-old peace, peace treaty between the Helchik and the Haida in 2014. So um, something that had been lost to our community, but found through its ties to another community, um, through an archival collection that was disconnected from both of us. Um, and now it is back in active use in our community. Um, there's one more, I'll let you know if I remember. Um, <laughs> so the ties of an academic studying the older collections and just synthesizing information that may or may not be right is entirely different from the engaged work where community has access to its own collections or people find something interesting but don't try to analyze and don't try to contextualize it themselves but bring it back to the community and figure out what that true tie is. Um, just gonna bring up a slide that I, um, I speak far from BC at times and at times I'm still answering the question why is this important? And that is heartbreaking, but it happens. Um, so cultural health. In Canada, the suicide rate for young people um, in our Indigenous communities is seven times and five times the national average. That's, that's heartbreaking enough, but um, the suicide rates drop to zero when over 50% of the community speaks its traditional language mm -hmm. from a study in 2008. And that's not a causal relationship, that's a correlation. Um, so maybe that language was never lost. Um, but the ties are um, undeniable that where communities are able to access their traditions, cultures, where they know language and um, can communicate that way, you don't see the evidence of suicide. So you don't see the same despondence. And if you think about what it means that there are communities where the, um, the rate is zero, think about what that means for seven times and five times the national average. Think about those communities where there is a suicide problem and what those numbers really are. So they are much, much higher than that. If there are communities where it's zero and that's the average, then where there is suicide, is, um, is even more heartbreaking. Um, so from my, my sister Kim Lawson, um, she did her master's thesis in uh, 2004, and she interviewed a number of our um, knowledge bearers who, are, who work with library and archives. Um, and she interviewed um, Shirley Sterling, um, also known as Sapitza, and she's an author who wrote my name is Sapitza. Um, and Sapitza said, they are precious fragments, a lost set of cultural traditions and activities. An artist who didn't know anything about his culture, he'd been away in residential school, went back and looked in the archives. You'd think they'd be dead documents sitting on a shelf, gathering dust, but they were really precious to him. He looked up the old carving designs and became a really well-known carver who revived his culture based on those archival documents. So sometimes they're just incredibly precious. And for those of us who are attempting to revitalize our culture, those documents provide tremendous value, valuable starting places. Um, and I'm gonna call on again Lorna Williams. Um, when she talked about the, uh, the shattered mirror, um, putting together the mirror is what we do. It might be distorted, there might be missing pieces, there might be pieces that are upside down, but we're putting it together and that's the most important part of our work. When you look at that mirror, you see the reflection cherish it. Even the cracked pieces, even the cracked pieces. We are strong and resilient. When you put those two together and you understand that the precious fragments in archives, the collections that can be connected to communities, the fragmented nature 
of what we're trying to do with our identities and our language culture, trying to bring back something and not knowing that the piece is upside down, well, those archival collections may be able to tell us. They may be those missing puzzle pieces. So, um, or they are those pieces that help us to align things and help us to reflect ourselves. And um, they lack integrity without us, and we lack integrity without them. So, thank you. For some, for some questions. So um, I will run around with this mic. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand if I can get the mic working. Hello? Yes, sounds like it works. Um, any questions for Jerry? Yeah, Laura at the back. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, what do you see as maybe the future of the digitization programs ad administered at MOA? Um, not really sure, uh, in that uh, we've been looking at whether or not um, supporting cassettes as a capacity developing measure is, is what we continue to do. Where can we be most effective? Because as you do something, there comes a point where it's just more effective you, to solve a different problem. So um, right now we're setting aside our grant, but we're uh, assigning that budget to pilot projects for the um, new formats that we're rolling out. So we're not going to stop supporting community-based digitization. Um, and again, we're probably gonna be doing many more workshops over the next year around a little bit more in depth. Um, I think we're trying to move um, I'm trying to move beyond, um, the fact is when we started, we were solving a fairly simple linear problem. We were picking low hanging fruit in that it's not hard to digitize things. It's a linear process. Um, you'll run into problems, but you run into problems with anything. The harder part is how you manage things and make them accessible afterwards. And I think that's where we need to bring on partnerships and we need to grow into um, how, how technically you manage something in a, scalable way when you're a one-person organization and don't have a lot of support or technical support, um, and how you make things accessible in an ethical way through indigenous access protocols. Uh, there aren't any, there are many systems that are designed for that, and the systems that are all have their scalability problems. So, uh, so I, mean, I, I would say that we, st we still exist as a program. We will still give the advice around practical digitization. Um, hopefully we expand as a program taking on sort of more people with more skills around the management side of uh, collections and making those accessible. Uh, one thing is we are actually contracting the Archives Association of BC for one of our workshops to deliver their Archive 101, so we can figure out what that's about and whether that's something that we will be sort of supporting and recommending for communities to, um, to engage with in the future, so. Thank you. Thank you, it's always good to hear uh, about this project and what's going on next. So you mentioned the RMN, and I'm always trying to envision how we can make that better, more useful, and one of the things I wish for is a platform like that, right, that brings numerous institutions together, but also brings archives in, right? So we know that there's all these pieces that got split across institutions, right? Some parts are in the North American Philosophical Society, some parts in archives of traditional music, some parts in law. If we could get those institutions onto the platform, can we also help a database that connects pieces that are, that should be connected, that were originally connected in community that now live in different places? Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, absolutely. Um, so. <laughs> So the Reciprocal Research Network is a platform that was developed basically mostly around material culture, around object collections in museums, allowing you to build projects, bring things that you like together, have discussions about them in a private or public um, way. Nothing completely public, you need to ask for a login and basically 
click off a EULA saying that you're not going to be evil. Um, and we do have internal discussions about that with internal being um, Alyssa Cherry and myself, our research manager who manages our archive. Um, none of us like archival software. Um, some of us who aren't archivists hate archival description. Um, that uh, there are things that are barriers in the way archives manage things, but archivists tend to love the way they manage things. Um, everybody, everybody loves the way they manage things. The great thing about standards is, like, anyway. The, so, uh, the, um, but Alyssa and I have had discussions about um, trying to put our archive into the RN, our archival material, um, instead of we manage, I think, three different digital platforms or four different digital platforms at a small university museum. Um, it, seeing where we can start to sort of put things together and make them more useful. Um, cross mapping 26 different institutions' databases is a difficult thing. When you add an entirely different way of arranging knowledge, that's going to be a problem, but uh, but absolutely, um, that's something that we've wanted to do is bring archival collections into the RRN and start reimagining the RRN as something sort of that does bring those things together. Uh, it, it would take more than just the two of us talking about it for five minutes. It, um, but, uh, uh, but yes, I think, I think there's appetite for it. Um, I'm not sure how much appetite there is for the scope of that project, if you know what I mean. Um, as someone who's just reopened a museum, but um, but yes, I think I think it's definitely necessary. And um, if you look at something like the uh, Vancouver Holocaust Education Center had a major project that used a system called Collective Access, and they integrated their museum collection, archival collection, library collection, and some other collection I can't remember. So basically, four different ways of organizing information were all. Um, accessible through one system, and it wasn't without pain, but it, they managed to do it. And uh, the person who shepherded that project is Elizabeth Schaefer, who's now the um, the head of sort of data structures at the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC. Um, so, so there there is some work done in the area. But. Thank you. So, so much for taking the time to explain the complexity of all the work that you've done over these years. Um, I just, um, when we were sitting in a room full of theater historians and archivists, and, uh, but also artists, and so I wonder if you have any, if you happen to know any examples of ways, times when um, the activation of the archives and museums and the collections and the re-engagement with communities, if they have resulted in artists in those communities uh, being able to engage and produce work that uh, impacts people in artistically? That's a really hard, it's a hard question to answer because the, the artists who work like constantly in community, it's just this sort of free flowing ongoing practice. So it's hard to say that this one thing spurred, it's almost gimmicky for one thing, it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know that you so much see like a single archival interaction that spurs um, something that has sort of great momentum community because I think the people who are able to make great momentum community are just constantly creating new things. And I mean, I think of um, the uh, young woman who created our logo, um, Alison Marks, uh, who was Alison Bremner. Um, she's just constantly innovating and creating and she works in archives and traditional methods, but then she, like creates the cat lady design and how the raven wiped out dinosaur. There was a t-shirt contest she won at MOA. And, um, she, there's just this spark in the artists who are both community engaged and um, constantly creating that, uh, that, that I think it happens all the time, but it just happens subtly across somebody's practice rather than necessarily in something big. But I'm sure other people have examples. Um, so we are at time, but we do have a, a break now, a 15 minute break, and we will have time with Jerry, you know, across the day and over lunch, et cetera. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, Jerry, this is a, a little gift for you. Um, so uh, a play, Kamloopa, um, written by uh, one of our um, uh, MFA writing students at the University of Victoria. Um, so I encourage you to read it and a Thank token so of our appreciation. So join me again in thanking Jerry.